tonight we're going to be looking at uh, recruitment. Uh, so the aim of tonight's session is to give an insight into the skills and experience recruiters are currently looking for in PR in the region um, and hear from some recruiters on current best practice and what makes a good candidate. And while we can't promise to help you get a job, hopefully in today's session you'll be able to pick up a few hints and tips uh, which will give you an edge in your next application. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll move on to our panel and they can all introduce themselves. Um, Rebecca, do you want to kick off? I'm first. I'm Rebecca Jackson. Uh, I'm an account director at um, Definition, formerly Accelerist. So we are a B2B specialist agency based in Leeds. Um, we specialise in a range of sectors, but I um, particularly specialise in healthcare and charity PR and lead the agency's training and development programme. Thank you. Um, Laura, do you want to go next? Yep. Hi everyone, um, I'm Laura Smith, I'm PR Client Services Director at J-Wing based in Leeds. Um, we are a fully integrated agency, so I lead the PR team, but we have everything sort of creative, digital, SEO, PPC, all of that stuff. Um, been working in PR for just over 10 years, recruiting for probably about half of that, um, but we specialise in more consumer focused PR, um, and very much sort of leaning into digital and SEO. So I hope to be able to give you some insight into that side of things as well. Fab. Um, Tori? Hello everyone, my name's Tori Pauls and I'm Senior Director of Media Relations at ASDA. So my remit covers pretty much everything in terms of corporate reputation, um, press office issues, and also all our campaign and brand. Uh, work which includes traditional media and uh, more sort of earned new media and I look after that for Asda and George our fashion range. Fab and finally Jen. Hi I'm Jen and um, so I work at Craft which is um, a specialist uh, creative and marketing recruitment agency um, I've been doing it about five years now um, and I purely specialise in PR and social media and content roles. Thank you and uh, hi I'm Dave Glanville, I'm chair of um, Yorks and Links CIPR committee uh, and when I'm not doing that I'm digital engagement lead for uh, Caveo Insurance and my background before that is 10-15 years of public sector comms doing a whole range of kind of PR comms and marketing. So without further ado we'll move on to our first question. Um, if people have got questions during these discussions, feel free to just pop them into the chat and we'll, we'll pick them up as we go along um, and we'll try and cover off any outstanding ones at the end. So, uh, how has the pandemic impacted the PR industry in the region and what are the biggest changes that you've seen? Um, so, from, from a B2B perspective, I think back in March, um, at the beginning of March, we, see, we saw quite a lot of clients um, freeze their marketing spend. Um, as we didn't know what was going to happen. And I think gradually over time, as um, business loans were announced and furlough was announced, um, companies were a bit more, um, uh, less reluctant, shall we say, to, to part with money. But um, we, we've actually seen a big rise in health and tech uh, companies looking for PR spend. And actually, um, even though marketing is often seen as a nice to have by companies, it's actually a really important time to engage with stakeholders and clients and especially staff. So whilst we saw a drop off at the beginning, we've kind of seen a lot of clients come back or new clients come on board. Yeah, I think we've had a similar thing at J-Ring from a consumer perspective, like a lot of budgets were paused or re-evaluated at sort of the beginning of lockdown, but we have really started to see that sort of start changing over the last sort of couple of months. Um, it's definitely busier than it has been. Um, I think some clients are slightly less wanting to invest in retainers. We're getting a few more sort of people coming to us about projects or at least short term work. Um, but overall, I would say it's getting definitely better now, um, which is really positive to see. I think from my perspective, working um, in-house and in a sector that's obviously been um, incredibly busy over this period, um, I think my perspective on this more is around the importance of PR and corporate reputation in particular during this period. I think never before has companies' reputations and what they do in response to the pandemic been as important and as in focus as it has been in the past six months. Um, if I think about the focus on 
communities, the way that companies have responded in terms of looking after their customers, looking after their people, um, those sort of messages that have always been perhaps secondary messages in a lot of um, sort of marketing and communication strategies have absolutely come to the fore. Um, if I think about Asda in particular for those first few months, um, it was no longer about selling products, which is what the focus of my life is normally. It was about how are we protecting people, how are we protecting our customers, how are we protecting our colleagues. Um, and really that reputation has been um, at the forefront, I think, of a lot of brands' minds um, during this period. And, and I think it's changed the shift, really, um, mm -hmm. in terms of what brands think about um, when it comes to their, their corporate reputation, that it's not just necessarily a nice to have behind, behind selling things. It's actually a really important string to their bow. And I don't think that will go away anytime soon. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that from an insurance perspective as well. Obviously, there's been a lot of focus on kind of insurance over the last sort of six, eight months for a range of reasons. And I think, you know, the, the realisation that trust is a really key part of that um, customer relationship um, has, has really come home to roost. So on to our next question, are RPR team still hiring? Um, yes, <laughs> uh, I think they definitely are. It has changed. Um, back in March, it definitely sort of, well, stopped overnight, really. I think there was a lot of roles um, getting put on hold. Um, companies were putting total freezes on. Um, and it has slowly started coming back, really. Um, obviously, not every agency and every company, there are still some freezes on. Um, you know, there's there's still a little bit of fear. And I think, you know, the sort of second spike and, and the possible another lockdown has changed things a bit but there are jobs there there's there's definitely them there and um, it's a little bit more competitive and um, unfortunately there has been redundancies um across the country um which i think has has made it more competitive for people um and i think we're going to speak further about how how it's changed but yeah there there are companies hiring definitely to add to that as well one thing we've been able to hire to replace some roles so that's been really positive for us but I have noticed that in the more digital sectors that's where I've seen sort of more roles being advertised and I guess it's just remembering that PR isn't just a more traditional PR agency or sort of a creative integrated agency you can find really great sort of outreach or digital PR roles it's kind of called all sorts of different things but within sort of SEO and digital agencies and it's a very very similar skill set especially if you're just sort of coming into the industry you'll be able to really hone your skills speaking to journalists getting to understand what, what stories are writing press releases working within a more digital SEO focused environment not just a PR environment um, we're lucky enough to do both things at J-Wing so we kind of cover both sort of spans but I see a lot of sort of those digital PR teams that are still hiring so don't sort of forget to look for those ones as well I think they can be a good a good way to find those roles as well. Okay great thanks so uh, with the traditional interview changing to accommodate social distancing do any of you have any tips for interviewing via video or remotely? Um, I would say, yeah, the, there's a lot more video calls at the moment. Um, and I suppose it's, it's going back to basics really, um, things that people might not be used to, um, if you're, if you're on video call. So things like checking the Wi-Fi connections, good, um, ideally using a laptop, um, it can be a bit better quality, um, or a PC, not your phone basically. Um, have been prepared so having your pens and um, paper water things like that around you so you're not getting up and, and things like that um making sure people are in and out of the room um if you're if you're at home and you've got kids or family around um not not the best situation not uh to end up like that guy on bbc news a few years ago <laughs> um so that sort of thing really being presentable um, and prepared I think that that's always quite important and um, being on time as well obviously just because it's just because it's at your house don't you know don't take for granted that you don't go on it at five o'clock make sure you're there at 10 to and that sort of thing 
Um, it can be a little bit more difficult to build rapport on video calls. Um, so all I would say there is, you know, I think they understand that um, and speak clearly um, and also don't be afraid of sort of silences because it's quite a normal thing in video calls. Um, and I think that they they understand that um, and they're, they're necessary, really. There can also be a delay which can cause silences. So. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Sorry, you go, Rebecca. No, no, you go, sorry. No, I was just going to echo that from Jen. Like, really, I've done two COVID um, lockdown recruitments where I hired people um, in lockdown um, and interviewed. Um, and definitely to, to what Jen said, um, really simple stuff like if you're normally used to Teams, make sure Zoom works and vice versa. The number of people that I was interviewing who bless them, it just sets it off to a bad start. It stresses people out um, if they, you know, they're not used to using it. They can't work out how to come off mute because they're used to a different interface. It's just not the start you want. It's a little bit like walking into the door when you walk into the interview room. It's just it sets you, you know, it doesn't set you up in the right in the right mindset. Um, so check those things. If you want to do a presentation, I had a few people who wanted to do presentations for us because that sort of anchored them, but they'd not checked that they knew how to share screen or that their version of Zoom could share the screen. So that again, it put them, it put them off. Um, and as the interviewer, you completely understand this is a weird, weird way of having to do an interview. But those little things just, they don't put you at ease in that situation. So you're trying to be your best you, but equally you're fumbling with like, where the hell is the unmute and why won't it share screen? So just checking those things before you go on makes a massive difference and allows you to be you when you get onto the screen. And the other thing is, is as Jen says, it's harder to make those connections with people. So you almost have to be a little bit more you than you would be normally in an actual room because they can't get the stuff from you in terms of your personal presence. So if you're a bit nervous, that really shows because you're just literally in this little box. So you have to be a bit more amplified. Um, otherwise, speaking really quietly is going to feel really, really quiet and shy. Um, being really sat back is going to feel really, really obvious. So you have to almost be a little bit more you than normal in order to get your personality across. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, just uh, from you know experience of meetings and things on zoom looking at having a good background having good lighting it sounds really basic but some people don't think about it until literally they open their laptop so if you can see um you know posters that it's great to have things that represent your personality but if they're offensive or if they might be a bit controversial just think about that um you know all the twitter accounts that have people's books in the background and you can read what are on the bookshelves just think about how it can be perceived and also um, people can really notice when you're not paying attention in a meeting. So if it's like um, you know, there's more than one person, if you're typing and you can see your hands like this or you're checking your phone, um, that really grates on me uh, when I'm in meetings with clients or colleagues. So um, we will notice that as well. What about things like um, backgrounds? Because obviously on, on Teams and Zoom, you can put comedy or effect backgrounds in. Love... Any thoughts on those? I love the person that set themselves as a potato for the entire meeting with the um, CEO at the beginning of lockdown <laughs> viral on Twitter. But um, I had a really serious meeting with the CEO of my biggest client last week and one of their colleagues turned up with a balloon background which had been at a birthday Zoom before and she didn't know how to change it and she didn't get much face time with the CEO so she just spent the entire time really like on edge because she didn't know how to change the background. So. Um, yeah, personally, I think don't go for the, the comic background unless you've already got. Um, okay. Just to pick up, David, just have one more, one more point on presenting if you're in an interview. Just really from what, what I've time. noticed, just from what I've noticed um, when interviewing people, is that on some, some interfaces, you can't necessarily see who you're presenting to when you're doing a slideshow. So because you might only have your laptop screen, it will hide the people that you're presenting to and you're just looking at your slides and trying to present to someone. And I've noticed it in candidates that it can throw them a little bit. Like, and I think it would throw anyone if you've never done that before. So either if you can get hold of a second screen, obviously the ideal situation is to be able to have your slides on one screen and people on the other but if not just make sure you've practiced presenting but to no faces so you can't try and make the eye contact through the screen you can't 
do any of that stuff that you try and do to build rapport um you're just having to work with your side so just make sure you've practiced that and got used to how that feels um because sometimes i can tell that people maybe start rushing through a few slides or they're getting a bit nervous that they can't see how you're reacting um but you if you've practiced that it should hopefully put you a bit more at ease but like and um, tori was saying we know it's a really weird situation for you but just anything you can do to feel a bit more relaxed um, that's one thing i'd recommend great thanks laura um, now, obviously, we, we may have quite a few kind of graduates or people that are just trying to break into PR uh, kind of listening. So how do people uh, choose what type of PR to get into? What's the sort of thing should they be considering? Um, I'll go first. Uh, um, so my, my background is not in PR. So I originally trained as a journalist um, and then I wanted to move into something where I felt like I was making a difference. So looking into the different types of um, PR and you know B2B versus consumer versus internal um, and I wanted to work on campaigns based projects where I knew I'd be working for um, something more positive than my journalist experience so um, I looked at um, agencies in the region and what kind of clients they had and I was looking at things like you know uh, when I joined Accelerus we had a big social housing arm we were working with a lot of housing providers charities and healthcare providers and that really resonated with me so I looked up all the kind of campaigns and case studies on the website and that's what really clicked for me um, but it's 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 a demanding industry so you have to make sure that whatever you go for that you really love it or, or that you'll really enjoy it because there are long days and be unsocial hours so it's important to kind of have that um, passion and belief in what you're doing you're working in this kind of kind of role but um i also knew i wanted the variety of you know working on different things in any one day so agency really appealed to me um but i know a lot of people that have gone in-house because they you know were so driven by one specific company and the, the beliefs and the values of those companies or organizations so it really worked for them it's just finding what drives you and what will make you um, happy to be you know on a photo shoot at 5am and think yeah this is actually what I really want to do. Yeah I'd completely echo that Rebecca I was thinking about this so I, I've been in-house um, all of my career I've worked in a number of different sectors education professional services government um, and, and retail and the thing that's always driven my choices has been a company that I've been interested to work for um, and I think that has to be the thing that drives it. Um, you know, you have to have that passion. From an in-house point of view, sort of similar to what, what Rebecca said, it's always been about really getting to know a company for me and all of the different assets and facets of it that I've really enjoyed getting into and being part of that business. You're always an SME in a business that doesn't do what you do when you're in an in-house role. Um, so you're always having to try and help people understand what you do and what you can bring to them when you go in-house. Um, which can sometimes be challenging. And I think one of the elements that I always um, am aware of with my team when I talk to them is, you know, from a, a career development opportunities point of view, you're always going to probably be in a small team in-house and therefore that opportunity to perhaps, um, you know, be promoted or take on a different role in the team is, is not going to be as readily available as perhaps it would in an agency side, but equally, you're potentially going to be able to work on broader remits of things and develop skills in a slightly different way so you know where there are differences there are also opportunities but absolutely just always go after something that you're really passionate about because there's nothing worse as Rebecca says and have to get up at 5 a.m in the morning to do something that you really don't want to do. Thanks Tori I, th I think my experience in um, public sector comms probably echoes some of yours there in that you know it's it's really broad remit there is a huge amount going on in both local and national government um, and it's 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 really varied you've got really big multidisciplinary organizations where you can be dealing with a specific portfolio of work or you can be dealing with you know media inquiries on a whole range of topics I recall one day having uh, media inquiries about uh, an infestation of snakes in a council house 
and uh, also a multi-million pound property deal that was going on uh, in the city and you know really kind of very different topics but you do learn a huge amount and you learn to kind of deal with a whole range of local and national journalists um, and working in a political environment was yeah you know, I really enjoyed doing that I did it for about sort of 10-11 years and you know once you worked in politics you know you, you do kind of get a, a buzz for it or you find out very quickly that you can't handle it at all and um, it, it's worth kind of understanding that there is a there is a lot to be offered in, in, in public sector kind of comms and PR as well. Um, so moving on to the next question, with so many people looking uh, for roles and likely to be competing for roles, would you recommend doing something out of the box to stand out to employers? Um, I think from a consumer agency perspective, which I think this is probably the most relevant for, obviously, I've only ever really, I've only worked agency side, but I think a lot of agency leaders and team leaders will talk a lot about doing something to stand out and I completely understand where they're coming from and for some agencies I would recommend thinking about what you can do but personally I do have some issues with the concept of people spending money to try and impress someone or sending something to an office or going to an office and trying to talk to someone or even like spending hours upon hours like filming videos or creating specific like slide decks for specific agencies. Like I know how hard it is to get to find a role and you're going to be applying for multiple different roles. You're going to be spending a lot of time doing that. And I guess for me, I, I don't want people to feel like they need to spend money and time when searching for a job is hard like it's a lot of effort and I think for me personally I'm looking for skills I want to know that you understand what PR is and you have some skills to bring to the table and if you think that filming something or creating something is really going to show that then great I don't want to discourage people from being creative but I also don't think it's going to it's essential for every role that you go for um, there will obviously be agencies that push that and, and really want to see that. I would say it maybe tends to be smaller agencies or startups, sort of um, owner managed kind of agencies. Like, whereas we're sort of part of a PLC, we have a very strict HR and recruitment process. Like, I need to make sure that I'm just looking at CVs and skills and cover letters and bringing people into interview based on that. I don't mm. I don't really need I don't need to be seeing your picture or a video there's a lot of sort of parts of that where I've had a lot of HR training where I want to make sure I'm bringing the right people in for their skills not just sort of that I've seen a video of them or I've seen you do something specific so I feel like maybe my views aren't a hundred percent representative of every consumer agency out there so definitely research the agency that you're applying to and what they like but don't think that you have to do that for every single agency um but I'm sure it kind of differs as well for different sectors and sort of from a B2B perspective as well, Rebecca. Mm, we would never, um, you know, want people to, like, like you say, spend money on trying to stand out. Or the only thing that I really care about when I'm interviewing is not the only thing that's bad. But um, I, when I meet people, um, I just I'm interested if they would get on with the team and if they have um, the right attitude, because like skills are great and um, at a junior level, I think having some kind of, you know, showing that you've done work placements or, or work experience or internships. But the biggest thing I care about is a good attitude, because if you come in with a good attitude, you can learn everything. If you're willing to learn, you're willing to get stuck in. And that's what I like. And also, I just want to know that you're going to get on with the team and that we can all go for a drink at the end of the week and that it's someone that you want to spend time with. If you're quite gimmicky and, um, you know, kind of all front, but then really you meet them and you think actually we're not a very good fit. When, uh, as a B2B agency, someone sending in some kind of gimmick wouldn't really work for us. It's just not the right fit. And I prefer, you know, if someone dropped me a LinkedIn message or um, if someone asked me to go for a coffee with them to just have a chat, then I would remember that more than someone sending me, um, I don't even know what, we don't get any freebies. Um, but, um, you know, when I was a journalist, we used to get loads of over-the-top things from PR companies. And I can imagine that some of the big agencies, especially in London, would expect that kind of thing. But I just want that kind of connection with someone that I think they would be a good fit for our team. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Jen, I've got a question for you. Um, what are the top skills that you're seeing uh, requested by employers? That they're looking for at the moment? 
Um, I suppose it's a bit of a boring answer, really, but um, I think the same skills as always do apply. Um, so in, in PR, I suppose in traditional PR, you know, they, they still want that um, media relations experience, depending on level, um, being able to create quality content. Um, more in a digital agency, I suppose there's that as well as the link building, um, possibly SEO experience. Um, and I think as Laura said as well, I have noticed it slightly going a little bit more digital um, in the need for roles recently. And that's not to say that traditional um, PRs aren't still hiring. Um, I suppose apart from that, um, something that is, it's hard to prove, but something that's definitely necessary at the minute is being able to manage your own workload. There's a lot of people that are starting new jobs now from home. Um, so I think it's something that employers need to know that you can work efficiently um, on your own if, if possible. Um, and yeah, being, being able to manage your own time. Um, and I suppose if you're, if you're going for a more senior position, then it's um, knowing when to kind of micromanage or, or not to micromanage if you're gonna be going in as a line manager. Um, I think that that's something that's quite important. As I said, it's quite hard to prove um, or quite hard to put on a CV. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably something. Uh, uh, what about anyone else? Have, what are you looking for in candidates at the moment? I think from our point of view, um, I guess the same, same as always and echo everything that Jen said. Um, but I guess if you're just starting out, um, you're kind of new, new to the sector, if you're a graduate, whatever your position is, um, I think having that understanding of digital could get you a, a long way and just kind of show that you've done a little bit of reading, you've taken an interest in what digital PR is or link building is. So even if, if I was interviewing for an entry level role and they could tell me why a followed link is important for a client, I'd be like, oh, you've really, you've really put some time in there. Like I'd be really impressed by even just that initial knowledge that's just meant that I know you've maybe read a few blog posts about digital PR sort of where that's moving to because all of that kind of digital PR side of things is relevant to traditional PR as well like I think we're only going to see those two things become more mixed so I'd say any reading you can do around digital even if it's a traditional PR role could sort of help to make you really stand out. Yeah I'd, I'd, sort of, I'd definitely agree with that and I guess it's funny because I um, almost inflict what Laura said and say, don't forget those traditional PR skills. So a lot of the time now I will talk to people perhaps more at a, a slightly more senior level. And a lot of what they will talk to me about from an experience point of view is paid influencer activity. Um, and um, that is absolutely part of what um, happens but equally traditional media relations storytelling knowing how to go after a story and what makes things interesting for people is always going to be really important from a PR point of view um, and I think being able to demonstrate that mix and that understanding is is really really important now that that possibly can be a little bit towards my preferences as well but I definitely think that demonstrating that breadth of understanding um, and recognizing what genuine news is um as opposed to um sort of focusing solely on some of the more content-led elements of what our roles are now is really really important you need that breadth of skill um because you're going to have to be able to pivot between the two of them um so yeah that's always really important to me and um, understanding where those two things can work hand in hand as opposed to being one or the other You got anything to add from a, a traditional agency background, Rebecca? I don't think anything that's already not already been covered. Um, I think digital is important. It's becoming increasingly important for some of our clients who are having to, um, you know, move online. So do things like webinars rather than events and conferences. Um, so having an awareness is becoming more important. But equally, at the moment, um, I think looking at new ways of getting in touch with journalists because a lot of journalists are working from home as well. So if you have built up good contacts through Twitter or uh, through your coursework, if you've got contacts from, you know, uh, 
um, projects that you've done things being able to bring to the table journalist relationships and new ways of working with journalists while working from home I think it's been like quite a struggle for a lot of agencies so showing that you understand that it'll be really really valuable I think okay so let's uh, let's talk a bit about CVs so what do you think uh, what's the best way to present a, a CV and what kind of things determine if a CV makes it through to an interview stage Jen, do you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, so I would definitely say um, spend spend time on your CV. Um, I know it sounds a bit of an obvious thing to say, but it it's you know the one thing standing in between you and an interview. Um, spell check it <laughs> um, and look at the format, that type of thing. Tailor your CV to to every job. Um, don't apply for every job you see. Um, because chances are that they're not all going to be right for you. Um, you know, if, if you're an executive level um, and you're applying for something that's senior account manager level, it, it's unlikely that you're just going to get lucky. Um, you know, there's, especially at the moment when it's so competitive. Um, so, you know, look, read through all the job applications to make sure your CV is right for it. Um, and yeah, tailor your CV. So um, really properly read through the job spec. And if you've done certain aspects that that job wants, make sure it's in your CV and, and you've done it, obviously, don't just lie. Um, you know, make sure it's in your your CV. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I like short CVs. So like two sides of A4 maximum um, with relevant experience and achievements on it. So I don't really care what you got at GCSE. I don't even know what I got at GCSE, that kind of thing. I just want to know, like, um, if you went to uni, um, what you learned at uni. I don't really mind that much what um, what you came out with from uni, what, what grade you got. It's more what you've learned and how you can apply it. Um, I think um, having a bit of personality, so just saying what your interests are so that I can get a feel for what kind of person you are, because, again, that's my preference, but I like to know that someone's got other interests and see how they would fit in with the team. Um, they don't need to be work related, you know, it could be actual interests that you have. Um, but I think a good cover letter is like so key because I get so many inquiries um, that are addressed to a colleague that left the business a year ago, or the one that really grates me is Dear Sirs. And I'm like, please. <laughs> Um, the majority of the SMT um, in our agency are women. So just do your research into who you're addressing it to. And if you don't know, um, you know, you can, most details for um, senior management teams at agencies or senior decision makers will be on the website, but definitely on LinkedIn. So you can do some research, identify the person that you think might be most appropriate. And if it's not, at least you've directed it to them and they can pass it on to someone else. Um, and research the position and the, the company that you're applying for. So look at, you know, I'm always really impressed if someone says, oh, I've seen the case studies and the, the you worked with this client and this client, and I really like that because X. And I think even if you've just gone through and done that for every single agency, at least I know that you've taken the time to actually read about us a bit. And it makes me think that you're interested. Because again, I get a lot just saying, I want to apply for a job, here is my CV. And I just forget them instantly. But if you email and say, I saw this campaign, especially if it's one of my campaigns, and I'm mm. like, great, someone's read about it. Um, but, you know, just showing that you have an interest and that you understand the kind of things that we've worked on. I mean, when I moved into PR, it was seven years ago, I made a list of every single agency in the region and the clients that they'd worked on. And then I approached them all individually, just speculatively to see if they had any roles. But I researched every single one individually to actually make sure that it was a good match and that it was, you know, work that I cared about. Um, and I mean, a couple of, well, I say a handful of agencies came back to me and they said, we don't have roles, but we want to speak to you um, because you've shown an interest. So I think that's also a really good way of going about it because sometimes, you know, roles won't even be advertised yet that um, the agency will just be thinking oh actually yeah 
we do need someone or we might be thinking about someone uh, in the future so it's good to get in touch and just show that you've, you've done your research. Yeah just to add to Rebecca's point about cover letters and mentioning case studies one thing that I sometimes get and um, being part of a PLC that has offices in Leeds, Sheffield, Newbury, London like we're all over the place and we're all sort of working on different accounts um, in that I'll get an email mentioning a case study which I'm like oh that's great they've looked on the J-Wing site but they haven't actually found a PR case study and it's quite clear that the case study that they're referencing isn't anything to do with PR um, especially at the moment we won't do soon but at the moment we do have our own J-Wing PR website that has our PR case studies on it um, and in the future like we will be able to sort of signify which cases are PR related. I obviously really appreciate when someone's gone to the time to look at any website and find some case studies. It shows you've put the time in, but I'll be even more impressed if I know that you've actually looked at sort of the right part of the agency and really sort of worked out what we talk about. I also share loads of sort of recent case studies on Twitter, on LinkedIn. So if you are following people from agencies, you'll be able to see the campaigns they're working on like as they happen, not even just waiting for them to get on the website and wait for them to work up into case studies. So that can be another way of sort of finding ones to reference that you may have seen, might have been featured in a newsletter, for example. So look for other ways as well to sort of see what people might be working on that you can reference in that cover letter to sort of help grab attention. In terms of submitting CVs, is, is the standard Word document still okay i mean there's a whole range of you know design software out there that people can access these days but is there any value in trying to do something a bit different through one of those or is a word document still just you know the best thing design document is lovely but it's still got the same information on it as a word document so if you're applying for a lot of jobs um you know i wouldn't look at a design document over a word document that's personal yeah I agree. More about just making sure it's really clear and easy to read. Like, don't, like, don't make it too busy. I um, need to be able to read like two sides of a CV and understand what it is that you do, what skills you have. Um, so don't, don't overcomplicate it. I'd go for a, a, a simple way of sort of laying stuff out, make it really clear. Obviously, if there is an element of design, lovely, but like Rebecca, I'm not going to choose that CV over another. It, I am going to read them and see what's on them. So a Word document is fine. I would say avoid a jazzy font at all costs though. To Rebecca's point about enjoying to see a bit of your personality, absolutely, but I don't need to see it in some random font that I can't actually read very well. Um, and sometimes actually, depending on the sort of portal that you're uploading to, um, particularly if it's for sort of large organisations where you might be doing it on some sort of website, sometimes attaching as both a Word doc but saving it as a PDF can be useful because the number of times if it's been done in a Word document that's in a version that's either older or newer than the version I've got, it can scramble it. Whereas if you save it as a PDF as well, it just sort of locks it down. Um, again, a nice straightforward font that I don't need to sort of decode to be able to read your CV is always a winner with me. No wingdings. No one needs a wingding. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, do we have any tips on how to prepare for an interview, especially when you've got no previous PR experience? Um, I would just say, that, I mean, the keys in the question really just prepare, um, you know, things like looking at the interviewers LinkedIn. Um, I often get people saying to me that they don't want to do that because um, they'll know that they've looked, but that is a positive. Um, I'd be interested to know what you guys think about that. But I think that looking at the interview, knowing their background is always important and um, how long they've been there, that type of thing. Um, researching the company, how long the company's been around, what they specialise in, what their values are, um, the job spec, make sure you, you're you really familiar with what the job is, um, the company, why you want to work there. Rebecca spoke a lot about um, her current company's clients and their values and that type of thing. Um, you know, do they lie with your values? Um, what sort of clients would you be interested in working on? Um, that sort of thing is really important. You can always practice difficult questions with family and friends um, as they can come up sometimes. Um, a lot of interviews these days in PR I find tend to be more chats 
um, talking through your experience, they talk about the company for a while than, than just questions, but they can come up. Um, I'd say that they're probably the main bits. Rem remember as well that you got an interview. So, um, you know, there is something about your CV or how you've approached them that they like. You're kind of halfway there. <laughs> yeah, and I think following on from that, it's kind of having the conviction in yourself and why you want to go into PR. So um, I remember my first interview at a, an agency, not the one that I joined, um, and they asked me if I knew what a certain term was. And I said, no. And they were like, well, I think you should know that if you want to go into PR. And I said, well, I don't work in PR at the moment, but what I do uh, know is I know how to write and I have good media contacts. So it's having that belief in yourself, not to be arrogant, but to, you know, if, if they point out that you might not know something or that you don't have the experience, it's saying, no, but, you know, this is how I can apply my learnings or my other skills that I have. And know your strengths. Um, don't bluff or lie because you'll get found out. But you can, you know, turn your lack of experience into something that you can own and say, I might not know it now, but I'm a quick learner and I have, you know, the right attitude that I want to get going and I want to learn these things. Um, because, you know, you know that you want to go into PR um, and you just need to think about how and why you want to go into PR and get that over in the interview, I think, as well. And don't let anybody um, kind of belittle why you want to do it. Um, I think just, just kind of have that conviction. Um, yeah. yeah, I think um, two of my best ever hires in um, my job have been to people who had absolutely no PR experience at all. Um, but what I really liked about them was them. They were enthusiastic, they were curious, they asked really good questions, they um, had gone beyond what was really obvious to look at about us. So I work for a supermarket, it's really not difficult to know a lot about us. And also, um, I guess to the point of, yeah, absolutely look at case studies, look at online information. To Jen's point, I've got no problem at all if you've linked and stalked me, at least you show it, you care about what you're coming to talk to me about. Um, don't quote the last two press releases on the website at me because that just shows me you literally looked at it 20 minutes before you came onto the interview and looked for the last two things that we said. Look a bit deeper at the company. As, as Rebecca said, you know, she researched the clients, she researched the background, researched the sector. Um, show that you're interested because at the end of the day, PR is all about being interested in stuff. Um, and so be curious about it and ask good questions. Um, don't be scared to ask questions and show that you you want to learn because there's nothing I can't stand more than someone who already thinks they know everything. We can all learn when we're doing our jobs. So I think they're the really key things, um, key things for me because that's what's going to sell you um, to to any any company. It's it's showing that curiosity and that interest in in everything everything that they they do and and expect you know at the end of the day we're not working in surgery so it's not going to be in a risk to anybody if they you know let you have a go it's not like letting someone operate on somebody when they've never done it before everyone can pick this up if they've got the right attitude and want to go into it for the right reasons and are willing to learn so don't let a lack of experience sort of put you off but just be curious um about everything and that that will always stand you in good stead in my opinion and I think from a, a public sector perspective, particularly in a political environment, if you can show that you can build relationships with people fairly quickly and trusted relationships, but, you know, particularly with journalists or, you know, with, with, with politicians, that's, that's a really powerful transferable skill, you know, because you, you can teach other skills, but that kind of building relationships and being able to kind of understand people's motivations and having that right attitude is, is a really good um, skill set to be able to demonstrate without having any kind of PR relation, you know, background. Um, so we just had a question come in, but unfortunately it kind of ties in with something that we're going to cover next anyway. So uh, if you've been working in PR for a, few year, for a few years and want to make a step up, how do you sell your skills to move from, say, exec to manager? Um, I think from our point of view, and I'll reference the question as well because it's really relevant for roles that I recruit for. So I think generally understand it, even if you're not actually managing something yet, if you understand the process of what it takes to manage a client project, like 
look at what your account manager is doing and understand the processes they're going through and then talk to me about that. I'll understand that at least you know what it means to be an account manager and what that kind of undertakes. Um, I think one thing that I always look for is client comms experience. So even if you're not the account manager, you might be leading aspects of weekly calls or you might be dealing directly with the client every day. I think that can be really useful to highlight. Um, I think the question is around line management and that's sort of really relevant for us because our managers are all line managers as well. And I know that's not the case in every agency, um, but all of our managers line manage sort of up to three execs um, and they manage their sort of full PDP process. They have a weekly one-to-one -one with them. Um, and it's very much a kind of line management and mentoring role that they take on when they take that step up. And I think for us, like I know that a lot of people, even if they've been an account manager before, may not have that direct line management experience. So as always, I think it's about those transferable skills. So where have you worked with a junior member of staff to identify a skills gap and help them to find the right training? Or how have you sort of gone about in improving their writing skills by sort of feeding back on amends before it has then gone to final sign off? Like think about little things that you might be doing every day um, but there isn't direct line management yet, but you can take those skills and kind of move forward with them. Um, I've had quite a few managers who've joined us who have never formally line managed someone, um, but they can always talk to me about how they've gone out of their way to mentor a junior member of staff, or they've sort of been like, oh, I've, I've worked on my um, proofreading skills by making sure that I review everything before it goes to a sort of the account director. Um, or an account manager, so I'd be able to feedback like that. So I think for me, it's always about just finding those little things that you're doing every day that just show that you'd be passionate about trying to develop a junior member of staff and sort of work with them. Um, so I hope that answers that question sort of from an agency point of view at least. Yeah, I mean, we're the same um, as, as you guys, Laura. We have um, a line management structure and everybody within the team line managers yeah, one to three people, I would say, actually. And a lot of the time, it's stuff that is so valuable to the agency. So, you know, a line manager taking on that kind of training and mentoring um, is so valuable for the senior members of the, of the agency that it's a real selling point. So being able to say, oh, I can, you know, I would like to take this on and I have identified these areas that I can help the agency with or, or help the organisation with, I think is incredibly valuable and should be a selling point anyway. So it's not even that I would think that you would need to convince somebody um, that you could bridge the gap. I think it's a really valuable skill and a really valuable thing to want to do um, for your own progression and for others within the team. Um, I think we have like, um, when you join, you have an official line manager and then you also have a buddy. Um, and during lockdown, especially, it has been so, so important to have those you know, one-to-ones, those check-ins for career progression, but also for just general um, culture and morale within the team, having a line manager and having uh, that kind of system in place to support other people within your organisation is so important. So um, I haven't really answered the question, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say, it's a really valuable skill and a really valuable thing. If someone came to me and said, I want to line manage, I'd be like, that's amazing please do. I also think it's important to recognise the difference, you know, in terms of leadership and, and attitude and skill set. And actually, you can demonstrate leadership without having to be line managing people. So, you know, if you've got ways you could evidence that. And I, I, a wise man once told me that managing was doing things right and leadership was doing the right thing. And you can always do the right thing, whatever level you're at currently. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to have line management skills to, to be able to kind of apply for those roles. That's a very good quote, Dave. I like that. I'll, I'll try and remember who told me it. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we've, we've got Jen with us, who's a recruiter. So I think, Jen, it'd be great to kind of hear your experiences of, uh, you know, how do people work with recruiters? How do they get the best from it? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the sort of basic process is um, you'd send me your CV. Um, through LinkedIn or email or however. Um, and we have sort of 15, 20 minute conversation um, fully about 
um, your experience, what you've been doing, what you want next, um, you know, what's the issue, why you wanting to move, um, whether it's progression, lack of progression or that, that sort of thing. Um, your expectations, so things like where you can commute to, if you're a driver, your salary expectations, uh, your notice period, that sort of thing, go through all that. Um, I can advise you on your CV, um, so we'll have a good look for your CV. Um, obviously, we were speaking about it earlier, um, if things need changing, like the font, <laughs> uh, things like that we'll talk about. Um, and then we'll sometimes have a plan of action right then and there. So if I've got roles in at the time that are right for you, I'll speak you through them. Um, we'll talk about location and, and that sort of thing, if you're able to get there. Um, Sometimes I will um, speak you through speculative approaches. I know Rebecca was speaking about that earlier when she was looking for a job. Um, so we would speak about um, any, it's mostly agencies that I work with, by the way. So any agencies in um, the area that um, would be suited to you. So, you know, you've worked on similar clients, that sort of thing. Um, or I think that the sort of... Um, the culture would suit you basically and um, I'm not doing quite as much of that at the moment just because the market's changed so much um, that I think clients are already getting a lot of that um, with there being more candidates about um, so we would normally meet as well but that's not happening at the moment really so possibly have a video call and um, so you'll be fully registered then and then as and when roles come in I'll be in touch basically um, normally on the phone, then email, quite old fashioned with that. <laughs> um, so one thing I'd say though, for, for the candidate, so keep a note of where your CV has gone. Um, if it's notes in your phone or how, however you do it, just keep a note of it. Um, you know, who sent you, where you've gone, what date, what role for, um, it doesn't look good on anyone really if if there's duplicate CVs, you know, if I'm sending you and you're applying direct or another recruiter is, just keep on top of that sort of thing really. Um, and then keep in touch with your recruiter, um, you know, before and after interviews. We are here to help you. Um, you know, chances are we've got quite a lot of information on that agency or that company that you're interviewing at or, or going forward to. Um, so yeah, just, just keep in touch all the time and be honest as well with what else you've got going on. Like I said, we're here to help. Fab. And um, I, I guess if people are applying for multiple jobs, particularly if it's going to be a first role, what, how do should people uh, kind of manage maybe having two or three um, offers or, you know, two or three interviews in a week, but the one that you really want is the one at the end of the week? What does that kind of work out like? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a good problem to have. <laughs> it's definitely, Pretty rare, I reckon. Yeah, well, you know, if you're a good candidate, um, if you come across well, then it's it's not unusual, really, um, especially pre-COVID when it was very candidate-driven. Um, so, yeah, like I said, it's a good problem to have. Um, I would just say, be honest, all the time. Um, if you're going for a recruiter, be honest with them um you know if if both roles or however many roles are through me obviously i'll know about it anyway um but if you've got say a direct one and one through me just be honest about it be honest with um the company as well that you're interviewing with so um they will normally ask um on an interview if you've got anything else on the go which is always a good sign um just be honest with them about it um you know, you don't have to say if that one that you're speaking to isn't your favourite. You wouldn't necessarily say that to them. Um, but just be honest about what else you've got on the go. Um, like you mentioned, I would try get your interviews as near as possible together. If you've got an interview, you know, on a Thursday and then you've got another final stage interview two, in two weeks time, it's not ideal really, um, because if they're going to be offering you, they're not really going to be wanting to wait that long. Um, so do try group them as much as you can. But normally companies will be quite understanding if they give you an offer and you say, great, I'm over the moon with it. But I do have another final stage tomorrow and it, it's a bit late to cancel. I do want to get to the end of the process with them. Most places will understand. Fab, thank you. Um Okay, so one challenge, particularly around uh, kind of lockdown, is uh, networking. So, 
how can we kind of get around the issue that we can't really network quite as well now that we're in, you know, in lockdown? What's a good way to progress networking? Um, so there are still things, there are still things online. Um, I don't, I mean, I really value face to face, so it is harder um, to network, but you know, attending events like this, I know it is the first one that we've done and we will be doing more, but getting involved with this is a great start. So looking out for kind of industry events in the region, um, are really important, engaging with things like hashtags and things on Twitter. I know Laura will talk more about digital, but um, having a, a digital presence is really valuable. Um, and equally, if there aren't actual events that you can go to, then maybe using the time to write a blog or um, kind of upskill yourself in other areas. So um, teaching yourself how to use um, design tools or uh, video editing tools that are available for free online. Um, just using the time that maybe you would spend networking or spend looking for jobs like that in real life and pre-COVID, um, using the time to, to kind of upskill and add extra things to your CV. Um, the other thing um, that I thought about was um, I'm a volunteer for a charity um, and charities always need um, PR support and especially social media support. Um, and a lot of them don't have any budget. Uh, so whilst I'm never condoning working for free, if you can volunteer and um, give your time to get experience for yourself, but also benefiting organisations that don't have the money to spend on things like PR and social, um, is a really good way of showing that, A, that you care about doing the job, that you care about, you know, the kind of community thing, but it will be helping them massively. I am, um, I volunteer for a charity, a local charity, and they don't have budget for a big PR campaign, but I give them advice on an ad hoc basis on things like social media. And I would guess that as graduates of a recent PR scheme, you guys will be far more up to date with social media than I am could therefore offer some really valuable um, advice and support which benefits both parties. Yeah I think just to touch on Twitter like Rebecca mentioned I feel like there's a really thriving maybe more digital PR focused um, sort of network on Twitter at the moment. Um, I think a lot of agency heads team leaders but also people of all different levels just sharing campaigns sharing knowledge sharing skills and um, there's just so much going on so i'd really really recommend sort of getting on twitter following some people from agencies that are sharing what they're working on i think that really gives you obviously the opportunity to like the post reply to them actually start a conversation but it also helps you to understand sort of what types of things we're working on um, what campaigns are working and from that you start to almost develop those skills of spotting a good story, spotting what a newspaper is likely to write about and it, it, it kind of works in all manners. You get to know more people in the industry but you're also supporting that upskilling as well by just getting to understand what we're working on. Um, so don't just think that LinkedIn is kind of the only way to sort of connect with people professionally. I actually think it's probably far easier in some ways to connect with people on Twitter and start sort of seeing what people are sharing. Um, so I think that would probably be my number one recommendation, especially during lockdown where we can't meet face to face to just get following people and liking and sharing and seeing what you can learn. I think it's worth mentioning um, kind of groups on LinkedIn as well. So there's a lot of industry groups on LinkedIn that you could contribute to and it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific PR and comms one. It could be the industry that you're interested in doing comms and PR in. Um, so it's, and again, there's kind of conversations that you can join in there or just begin to kind of pick up who the influencers are in that space. Mm. And if you're not sure about who you should start following, Laura is a very good person to follow and will often share campaigns and things that I then see other digital people engage with. So if you don't know where to start, Laura's a good start. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> and of course, you can follow... Um, the CIPR on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Also the CIPR, yeah. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> That's all right. There, was, there is um, hashtag CIPR employability as well, um, which is a hashtag worth looking at. And the employability hub on the CIPR website will be will be worth a look too. Um, 
So I think that's kind of drawing things to a close. Have we seen any more? Has anyone got any more questions they'd like to submit before we uh, sign off? I know we're about on time. I've not seen any more come in. I'll give it a minute for people to frantically time. Um, in the meantime, um, we can, I mean, you've got all our names on here. So if you want to add any of us on LinkedIn or follow on Twitter, don't follow me on Twitter. I don't share anything that valuable. But um, the rest of us are like, if you kind of connect with us, we definitely kind of remember people and bear in mind, we do a lot of our recruiting through LinkedIn. So people that I've met at events or um, the awards that usually take place every year, um, we like I will remember them. So um, please do connect and if we can help at all as well. Um, you know, I'm always available if anyone wants to ask questions about, um, you know, placements or any other particular questions about agency life. Happy to, happy to help. Great. Well, I think that's probably about it. I'd just like to wrap up by thanking all our panel um, for joining and giving up their time and their, their skills and expertise. So thanks for coming along. I hope this has been useful for all watching. Um, and look forward to doing the next one. Thanks everyone. Thanks Dave. Bye. Bye.